and away we go. Welcome in, everybody. It is time for Three Guys Before the Game. This is our Arizona Game Recap, episode number 587. The fellers are in. The Dean, Hoppy Kerchival, front and center. He'll be providing Hoppy's obvious observations. El Senatore, Brad Howe here. Spreads on stats. Coming up, recapping. West Virginia and the Wildcats. And three guys before the game is brought to us by Comax Business Systems, keeping West Virginia's business data safe, secure, and efficient for 25 years. By GoMart. Get a GoMart rewards card and instantly begin saving on food and fuel. Visit GoMart.com for the details. By Lou Wendell Marine Sales in St. Albans. They, well, they sell family fun. Who doesn't want family fun? Visit LouWendellMarineSales.com. By Tudor's Biscuit World. Start your day the homemade way. Start your day the three guys way. And we just did. We just completed <laughs> our biscuits thanks to Hoppy. He brought them in for us. Thank you, Hoppy. You're welcome. I had one as well. Very nice. Three guys also brought to us by Conley CPA Group, providing value beyond numbers. What do the numbers say coming out of the Mountaineers and the Wildcats. We're going to get into that and more textual healing as well. All right. Court is in session. Thanks very much for being with us here. West Virginia goes out and uh, plays its most distant conference game in school history, depending on how you got there. It's, it's a little bit over 2,000 miles. It's 1,800 uh, miles in the air. It was not a bad trip at all. It took three hours and 50 minutes to get out there. Fortunately, didn't have a whole lot of headwind. Made it back in three hours and 22 minutes. How do I know it was 22? Because I start my phone as soon as the wheels go up on the plane. So it wasn't bad at all. 322 travel was about as good as you could possibly uh, have it. Scheduled to arrive back at the facilities uh, building, the Push Car Center, uh, at 530 and we pulled in at about 526, 27. Just like a bowl game. Just boom, right on time. So that's all Just good. Just like a bowl game. Yeah. Nice. Went to nice weather in Arizona for the yeah. bowl. Had some nice activities for the young men. Yeah. Well, the uh, Rich Rodriguez Bowl is one of the favorites. Well, it did, you know. feel, it did feel bowl-esque because we stayed at a, a motel out there, uh, which, uh, which is a resort. Where teams do stay for for bowl games, so nice. it had the that. The bowl staff was very nice. To you. The yeah. hospitality room they yeah. had set up yeah. was excellent. Was you could use that each night. That was great. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was very nice. It was also nice parents bowl gifts as you walked away. A couple nice a couple nice watch. sweatshirts. Got a, watch. got a nice watch out of the bowl. Parents weekend uh, on campus there at Arizona. So there were a lot of uh, parents. Right, that's what it does. It attracts parents, is what it does. And um, one <laughs> one, one ob- weekend attracts yeah. parents. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So one observation. One observation. And with all due respect to uh, parents out there that might go to parents' weekends at other schools, I would never wear a school name dad T-shirt. You wouldn't? Like, see a lot of Arizona, the logo, dad T-shirts. Eh, probably not. Some of that might be the daughter or son gets it for the dad, yeah. and they feel compelled to wear it. Yeah, all you, you care. They can wear whatever you they just, want. You just say thank you, and, you but care? you don't wear it. Well, it's your choice. That's not their choice. You don't tell people what they can wear. It's like when you dress your kids up when they're three and they don't know exactly what they're wearing yet, but you kind of chuckle over it. Still had a lot of empty seats there. Yeah. Yeah, they do. That's, yeah, they that's do. Not the, that's not the toughest. All due respect, that's not the toughest environment. No. It's not the toughest environment. No. You, go in there, you, you go in there and you get your W and you, you move on. 31-26 to 26 is the final score. We'll break down the numbers. It was so, so badly needed. Because if you lose that game, not only are you three and five, you're three and five with an asterisk, which is you have a bye week. And it would be a 14 day fester that would probably continue to bubble and grow and probably have some seepage. I mean, that kind of a just a, a canker big, sort of big fester, you know, an ulcer. Like that thing. A lot of interesting things uh, on the trip. I'll get into those things a little bit later as well. Yeah, but instead, it's a win. On your furthest road trip, as you just mentioned, with a backup quarterback and a backup left tackle and a backup cornerback, and you walked in and got the win. You had to hold off Arizona at the end. You got it done. Really strong offensive performances. We'll get into some numbers. Super impressed 
with how they handled that with both Johnny Williams yeah. and Nico, the two new guys in the lineup, just absolutely outstanding. Yeah, and if you go back to our preview that we dropped on Thursday, uh, just go through the tape, you'll see where I predict that Jalen Anderson would catch the game-deciding pass. Right. On, I think uh, you did. Yeah. Might have been all fair when you said that. Dude. Today. If there was one person uh -huh. you would not have put on the possible list of 30 people that would touch the ball, it would be Jalen Anderson. Really remarkable. I'll just give you an early spreads on stats number. The number's one. That would be receptions on the season by Jalen Anderson. And it came in a, as big a moment as you can get. I mean, talk about, a, talk about a pinch hitter coming in. You've been sitting around for three and a half hours watching the game. Now, I know you play some special team stuff. No, I agree with you. But you hadn't been on an offensive play yet, and you come in, and by the way, oh, no, you're not just in. You're not just a decoy. You're not just going to throw a block and go hit somebody. you got to catch the football, and then you got to get upfield because if you get that, win the game. If you don't, and you got to throw that defense back out there, look out. Yep. There was a little bomb on the, there. That ball kind of popped up there. My man, my man popped it up, but he got it and took off. And that's great for that kid. He's had some high-profile mistakes over the last couple of seasons that have not gone his direction. That was pretty cool to see him make a big, massive play at that to stay the course, get upfield, and seal that game off. The, the Jalen Anderson catch and run first down at that point was more surprising than the Leighton Bechtel touchdown. Right there. Oh, I mean, big, oh, big play too. Well, oh. but but let's, that's just another day in the office for Leighton. I mean, <laughs> he he does it in Charlotte. He does it in Tucson. Just, that's what he does. You mean Leighton Bechtel, the touchdown yeah. maker? Touchdown maker. And he and uh, he he ended up just short in the bowl game, right? He just he yeah. ended up just short. So good for him. He's a really uh, he's a really good kid. Really good kid. He's a part of the fifth quarter program. So I've got to chat with him a little bit, and uh, really super happy uh, for him. Had that was great cool. running back vision. Yeah. Rolled up there, saw the lacrosse, hole on the left, popped dude, to the outside. Dude, lacrosse play, yeah. lacrosse players are bad boys. I mean, they're they're tough dudes. I also it, understand how to get around guys. Yeah, yeah who, and good. who we were trying. To, I don't think we could pick it out. Maybe you could. You guys could. Who made that block on the left side? Because somebody made a heck of a block on the left yeah. side. Without that block, you might not get it. You're right because sometimes on those fakes, you, you it. It gets just a little tight. It gets a little tight. No, sometimes in there. it just like got. They have no idea. Yeah, no right? idea. They, the other team is totally acted as no idea. The end for Arizona there actually contained the edge. I mean, he yeah. was on the edge, standing up, looking in the backfield like he wasn't rushing. He didn't fall down. He was ready for something like that. And there was a great block on that left edge there of the the offensive line that that cleared that space. While we're here, we might not have big spreads on stats. I'm giving them all to you right now. I just found this interesting. Thanks to uh, Game on Paper website. Excuse me. Game on Paper. The biggest play of the game from an increased win percentage perspective mm -hmm. was that touchdown off the fake punt by Bechtel. Added almost 14% to your win expected win percentage at that point. So you usually know that, right? You yeah. get weird things like that that happen in your game. You throw a pick six, it's hard to win. You get a fake t uh, field Do goal or punt that converts into points. It's hard to lose that game. That one was the biggest play of the game from a win perspective. Yeah, I was win wondering. Percentage. I was wondering what that did because, you know, when you just as you said, those certain stats pop you up with your chance to win. All right, time now for Hoppy's obvious observations. H O O. What do you have? Well, some of them we've already touched on, but number one was the again obvious Nico Marchio. I mean, Markiel was A+. plus. He was exceptional. I mean, we'll have more spreads on stats, but uh, Nico was 18 of 22, 198, two touchdowns, very efficient, no picks, made plays. Uh, the misses were, most of his misses were those long, you know, a couple of long passes early. So, I mean, he was extremely efficient. So, obvious observation, Nico was just, um, he excelled in that ballgame. Second is, we talked about this a lot over the last couple of games, Tony, in our coverage, and that is, Needing guys to make plays. Didn't expect Nico to do everything, but he really excelled. But who else was going to step up and make plays? Well, how about Huddy? Huddy made a great catch on a rocket pass in the end zone. How about um, Jaheim White on the 55-yard run? We talked about Jalen Anderson. Talked about Leighton Bechtel. Also, that, that forced fumble, which turned into seven points coming the other way. Was that KK? That caused that fumble. KK Tarnu caused the fumble and yeah. Grant uh, Garnett Hollis. Yeah. So yeah. there were just a lot of plays like that. Guys making plays. The long field goal by Hayes, 45 yards. And also, the third point would be you got some breaks. Those things tend to even themselves out. We've seen a lot of times this season where you just didn't get a break. It wasn't really your fault or the other team doing something great. It's just the ball bounced a weird way. You got some bounces, you got some timely 
penalties against the other team. You got a couple breaks. And those things combined to get you a win. Yeah. Let, sure. Let's talk about those breaks for a second. Just spreads on stats? No. But you need breaks to win yes. games, right? And, yeah. and as you know, guys, you know my stance. You don't apologize. <laughs> you don't back off any. You don't qualify. When you win. Go with it. I was going to say F everybody. You, you, just, you just take the win, man. I mean, I don't care what you say. You just take the win and you move on. So there's there's my stance on the win. But in, you need you need two things. Hoppy just said one. You guys make a place. Mm -hmm. It's just as simple as that. Multiple guys have to make plays. What's your did? You need some breaks. How about these breaks? Let's go back and play this through. Ready, Tony? I'm ready. There's three big ones that stood out to me. One, CJ converts on that third down. Yeah. That looked like he was stopped behind the line of scrimmage. Huge, you're exactly right. And then kind right. of squirts through. Yes, yes. Very next play, what happens? Jaheim yeah. White, 55 yards, sets up a touchdown score. There was the third down option pitch. Yeah. That in non-Mountaineer fashion, <laughs> not only didn't turn into a fumble, because Cole Taylor might go out for the men's soccer team. He booted that thing straight out of bounds. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was potential. But not only was it not a fumble, not only was it kicked out of bounds to save the fumble, but then all of a sudden those officials who did a tremendous job on that play, Hoppy, they were right on top of it, as you would expect from the officiating crew. They knew exactly what they were doing. Called it an incomplete pass yeah. on a forward pitch. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And then what happens? Turns into a fourth down conversion on the very next play. Three plays later, CJ walks into the end zone for a touchdown. Talk about a massive change because that was the one that came on the, you pinned them deep, then they shanked the punt, you were taking over in their possession, it was a golden opportunity to get points, and you almost let that opportunity slip by, which would have been a perfect opportunity, and yet those that break happens to you, mm -hmm. and you get it, fourth down conversion, CJ scores a touchdown. That's break number two. How about the pass on third and nine? That, that goes directly through, yeah. through the defender's hands, Hop. Yes. I mean, the, the defender had his hands in perfect shape. The ball goes through his hands, hits a couple fingers, and not only is it not picked off, Huddy keeps his concentration, makes the catch for a 19-yard first down. Excellent, right? Mm -hmm. Very next play, Traylon Ray, 54-yard touchdown. So you talk about three gigantic yep. moments in that game that preceded the big play. I'm not talking about the big play. I'm talking about the plays that preceded the big play that went in your favor. That You were due for some of those. You were due for some breaks. You got them in that game. No, those are all really good points because if you don't bring those back up right now, you totally forget about that. Totally yeah. forget. But to your point, that play that was ruled as a forward incomplete pass, that's huge. And, you know, and I personally, and we, some of you do, but we all kind of – grit our teeth about replay all the time. But in that particular case, that like 15 years ago, like no one blinks an eye on that. Don't even think you about just, it. The ball's got kicked out of bounds. That's where it is. See you later. Well, that was an excellent use of replay right there. Perfect right. use of replay officials right on top of it. Did a very good job. And also in that, I mean, you're right, Brad, because if that had gone out of bounds, you would have had a fourth and long and you would have punted. But instead, you, you convert. By the way, you were four of four on fourth down. And, and punted, and, and again, because of the situation that preceded you getting the ball back, that was such a golden opportunity. Yeah. That's one of those moments in a game that you look back macro level and would have gone, man, you just really yeah, left that on the opportunity. table. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. What I'm doing right now on the phone, I'm watching. Don't watch it again. Am I? No, no, I'm watching the fake field goal. 56. Set the block. It was a good one, right? I mean, you can you see me, the defensive left, end standing left, there. The left side, left side guard pulled 56. Let me look it up. You, 56. Do you know who it is? No, off the top of my I'll head. I'll look it up. I'm sure he's a sure he's a fine young fella. 56 for the Mountaineers. Give him a give him a gold star. Give him a that big Sully Weedman. Could be. Was it Sullivan Weedman? Take a look at it. Three you guys before it, the game. Yeah, I got, I got it. Three guys before the game is brought to us by Comax Business Systems. What they do is they walk alongside you when it comes to your business equipment needs. Any kind of gear, they got it. But especially right now, their business phone systems. From one line to 1,000 digital lines, they got you covered. The technology has absolutely changed from what we used to know. Remember those buttons you used to push down? I mean, put you on hold. It's changed a little bit. It's changed a little bit now. If you're a business owner or need a business phone system, contact the folks at Comax wv.com that's comax wv.com bob maxwell and the folks there at comax are truly really genuinely nice west virginia people 
and they will do a deal with you, competitively priced. You can purchase, you can lease, you can rent. I don't know, maybe barter. You know, well, a couple, couple, sure about that. couple bushels of tomatoes. See what they can do for you. Uh, visit them at comaxwv.com. That's comaxwv.com. You got it. I'll get there. I, you know, I need the sports website at WV to work about once every six months, and it just froze right well, now. I, I mean, do you have to take a nah, shot? I just mean, need it one time. Just once. We'll t- look at it again until uh, March, but just need it once. Uh, what number? I can look it I up. I got it. I got it right here. Yeah, I got it. I mean, I can find it. I'll just go dig into my chart here. Anyway, I think it's Sully. Well, as first reported here, Sully Weedman. <laughs> Give him a ton. Give it was him a great ton. block. He pulls... He sets. And 11 is right there waiting on a fake. I mean, he did exactly what he's supposed to do in that situation. Yeah. Good job. So that was, uh, that was a big, big one. All right. Um, we'll get into a bunch of different stuff. We're getting the spreads on stats right now. We'll break this thing down, but a bunch of different directions to go. Also, the Mountaineer basketball team, we'll give you a quick touch on this. They played their double secret closed scrimmage game at the Raleigh County Armory Which on you know Friday. nothing about. You have no idea what happened. I may have asked a few questions to some people. That well, you're not really supposed to talk about that. We're there. Yeah. And this is, uh, the first you can get in trouble for that still? Is that the one thing? Is that the one rule you can get in trouble for now? Um, no. Nah. I've, I've never heard anyone censured um, for it. But what I thought, Raleigh mm-hmm. County Armory is kind of a big expanse of space. Yeah. You know, a lot of like, uh, a lot of entry points. Oh, you're saying security was at a minimum? No, and I, so I said I was thinking. I go like, I bet you there was a you know good hand. So I asked someone that was there. I said, how many uh, how many people like just kind of found their way? And they said zero. Really? They said like it was no one that wasn't supposed to be there, wasn't there. I mean, it was there. It was just like huh. it was tight. So it was tight. Hmm. Um, quick overview. It was Speak a good in general terms here. I'm thinking in general terms. It was a good day for the Mountaineers. Took on the Demon Deacons of Wake Forest. Mm. They're predicted to finish 3-4 in the, uh, in the Atlantic Coast Conference. Got an NBA guy on the team. Yeah, they do. And uh, it, was a good, it was a good effort by the Mountaineers. And the two coaches agreed not to put highlights out. Mm-hmm. or I don't know about highlights, but no box score, no score. No pu- don't publicize it. Either don't way, publicize decided it. before the game. Just say things went well. Darren and Steve Forbes, friends. Two Iowa guys there, so they've known each other for a long time. Yeah. So that's that. And uh, basketball now is a week from Monday. That sounds silly to me. Excuse me? It just sounds silly. I mean. But what? That, oh, it's double secret probation. Don't say anything hey. to anyone. Don't give a box score. Don't. Yeah, yeah. How? Why? Because the NCAA is trying to cling to its existence. I mean, they're hanging on to be some form of powerful entity and this is the last bastion of hope <laughs> to, to hold back the box score on scrimmage games. Don't when you? Yeah. Now, some of it from a from the coaching agreeing perspective, it's one of those where you want to get some work in, and some things you're trying to work on, and sometimes you're not necessarily trying to win the game. So I get okay. where those coaches say right. that. Right. And, and listen, today's day and age, the loser of that, the loser of that exhibition scrimmage is going to get some calls for his job. <laughs> Mike gets so fired. you want to just Mike like go fired. in and get some practice get some work in and you don't have to make a big deal yeah. speaking of which uh brent brennan not gonna have a good week yeah probably not no sorry but okay we got our own stuff to talk about probably probably not you know uh another thing <laughs> respect don't Pittsburgh. care i don't care one other thing about um and I'll, we'll get into spreads on stats but one other thing about those basketball scrimmages where you can't put a total amount of credibility into them is because depending on how the coaches want to do it in this particular one, you couldn't foul out. <laughs> you couldn't, you could not foul out. And so there were players, I think there was a player on each team that may have had double figures in fouls. <laughs> NBA summer league rules. NBA summer league. Like, hey, because, got, so hey, think, hey, hey, that's your 10th. Think Coach, about, he's got 10. Here's why, Hop. Here's what you're trying to do. You're there to get work. Right, okay, okay. Right, so right. If, you, yeah. if you get a guy with two fouls in the first few minutes and you have yeah. to say to him, what good did that yeah. do you? In a, in a scrimmage, it's non-publicized, so. And they'll do situational stuff. They'll go like, hey, we want to look at zone. We're going to inbound the ball at midcourt. Let's play, you know, let's play five possessions. You play zone. Oh, is that we'll what play. they do? Okay. Yeah, and then, For some of it, then they scrimmage. Then, 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 they then you go, scrimmage. okay, that's done. Now let's go up and down. So okay. Anyway. All right. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. We'll just go right to the numbers. Here comes a heater. Let's jump into the uh, analytics portion. 
this open to the public? What this portion Spreads is open. Yeah. Is open to the public. This is open to the public. This portion is. <laughs> is there another part that's not? <laughs> Spreads on Stats is brought to us by the great folks at Conley CPA Group. They do provide value beyond numbers. They are a complete service, public accounting and consultation firm, taking their business clients and opening opportunities for them, giving them the old, you know, if you do it this way, you'll save this much, which is always nice, I think. Getting ready for their 40th uh, anniversary. Outsource your accounting. They can do that for you. Outsource your CFO services. They can do that for you. Valuable guidance to help boost your efficiency and let you do what you want to do, which means run your business instead of dealing with all the other stuff. It's Conley CPA Group. Did the final analytics of this uh, match up between the Mountaineers and the Wildcats resemble the game, or were there some surprises as you dug in? Uh, no, I thought it, I thought it kind of held it. It shows, I won't go through all of those right now, but it shows that it was a pretty even game by the end, which it, which it was West Virginia win probability wise was really never in too much danger of losing that game. So you had real, really good game control. Hop college football playoff likes to use that game control. You had a lot of game control in this game, but a lot of the the individual advanced analytics were pretty similar. But there were some that that really jumped out to me, and let's let's dive in. And there might not be a lot of a continuity in how I I present these, so I'm just going to kind of throw a bunch of things at you. But guys, I think we have to start with Nico's performance here because Tony, you go back to Thursday's preview, and we were we were asking the question. You were getting Nico in a position, which he's been before. He has started a game at West Virginia. He's come in in long relief. How would it look? In the previous games, we did the numbers, Hoppy. The defense in Nico's previous starts or long relief appearances, the defense had only given up 12.6 points per game. Mm-hmm. So you you weren't asking Nico to go win you the game or go be the main offensive threat to win you the game. You were saying, just don't hurt us. Let the defense win it, and we're going to run the football. And you'd averaged 163 yards on the ground in those games. This was a different deal. One of the things we talked about on Thursday and in our coverage hop the whole time was yards per attempt. You were going to have to get the ball down the field. Nico had only averaged 4.5 yards per attempt coming in. That was last in the Big 12 among quarterbacks that had 10 attempts. So when he had been in, you had not asked and or had success at pushing it down the field. Well, that really changed. It helped, It was helped by Traylon Ray, the big bass play, but that ended up at nine yards per attempt, guys. Double what he had been throwing it okay, as. Yeah. You had some other ones. You had the one to Hudson Clement, 19 yards down the field that we talked about. In the first half, that was seven and a half yards per attempt. So it had already jumped up. And that's a that's a respectable number. That's right in the range where you can you can manage it. It had it had started to creep back, and it got all the way down to six yards per attempt. Hop as Arizona was making his comeback, and, and West Virginia had slowed a little bit offensively. Then the 19 yard pass, then the big play to Traylon Ray. That thing pops up to nine. So a lot of credit on a couple fronts to Nico in particular for pushing the ball down the field, managing the game extremely well, didn't make any bad throws. The one that, again, went through the defender's hands was was really the only one that was in danger there. Other than that, he made some excellent decisions, tucked some instead of mm-hmm. forcing yes. it and trying to make a play. So you can't say enough about the job Nico did. We talked going into that game also about completion percentage. You had to get more efficient as well. Nico came in averaging just 53% completion percentage in his career. Just a 53% passer. Guys, went for 82 last night. Yeah. Went from a 53% career passer to 82. Mm-hmm. Just incredible. And then credit Neil Brown and the offensive staff for the way they called that game, especially early, getting him some passes to get him comfortable and greased up, and then expanding it out, right? Adding some motion, adding some new wrinkles and looks. So I, I just I can't say enough about the job Nico did coming in in that spot. And we said, Tony, we said on Thursday, having that week to prepare, having the week to rep the plays that you were going to run, and then Nico talked it in post game, a hundred and so reps he estimated. And it showed. I thought he was completely yeah. in command. And then there was one other thing that a little nuance that that was impressive for a guy that hasn't played a lot of snaps. There were a couple different times 
on screen passes. One was on a screen, just the old traditional screen, where he really just held it and kept holding it, let the defense come in, let him come in, and then just dropped it over to Cole Taylor, which created that space right. that he needed. There was another one where he rolled out and he was looking for the receiver, and he waited a couple extra beats, let the let the defender get to him. That cleared the space, dumped that off. So I thought his patience for a guy that hasn't taken a ton of snaps was really good. He looked like a veteran starting quarterback. Yeah, he really did. I had the feeling going into the game that he wouldn't be in the middle of his performance. I thought he was either going to be really good or the moment going back to Arizona and all of that, you know, that could sometimes that puts too much of a light. Yeah. He he was exactly what you would hope for. And Neil Brown said this, the kid's a winner. Like in everything that he's done, he finds ways to win. And he went out there and he won the game by not making mistakes. And as you said, that completion percentage – um, is off the chart at 82 percent so uh, kudos Incredible. to him and you know he, he also had another touchdown that got dropped in the first half he dropped that ball perfect to Traylon Ray down the Arizona sideline early in the game do you remember that very yeah, I thought early it was, it was a it was a and tad long a tad long it, it was rated it as was a, there it was rated as a big time throw by pro football focus but that's that's a tough one it, i mean it did hit trailing he was extended with the one hand but it was it was a great throw just maybe just a, a six inches too far but pro football focus agrees with you they gave it a, a big time it throw. was there anyway regardless you got one uh trailing ray was able to get one later in the game and uh, it was it was significant yeah so um Really, really happy. All right, let's 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 continue on to some other things we talked about in terms of Nico in the pregame. We also mentioned when he's in the game, play action and RPO percentage, usage percentage of those two schematics go up. And you saw that last night again. You saw him really handle that RPO and then make the pass. The play action on one of the big deep balls came off an old school, like fake the handoff, then turn, mm. come up and throw it deep. And if you look at West Virginia's analytics, that, that happens. When he's in the game, those shoot up by a significant percentage in terms of usage. We also talked in pregame, the short middle was going to be the spot where West Virginia could attack. That was both via the defense of Arizona and what you do off some of those RPOs and play action. Short middle, 8 of 9, 68 yards on passes 0 to 10 yards in the middle of the field. Put it where it needed to be. 8 of 9, 68. You'll take that. Middle of the field in general, 15 of 17 for 135. Just cooked them right down the middle of the field where they were missing some linebackers. They were missing some safety, so you thought that was an area you could attack. They did and were productive with it. 15 of 17, 135, guys. You'll take that all day long. We talked on Sportsline on Friday night, and then in our coverage, I put the number out there, an over-under of 250 combined yards for Nico. Thought high. he might need to get to 250 for West Virginia to win the game. 243, is that what the number finished up? Uh, he had 39 run yards and 198 passing yards. That's 237. So there you go. So he he came through in a way that you, you were going to have to have him make plays to win you the game, not just manage it. We know the defense has struggled. This wasn't going to be a game where you could just say to the defense, go help the young quarterback. you got to handle it. You were going to say to this one for the first time in Nico's career, we need you to go make plays. And, and man, he came through. He was really good. So there's the Nico numbers. Let's talk big plays for a second, Hop. We, we've said for a while this offense was so good last year at the end of the year because they would just big play you to death through the air on the ground. Teams have adapted to West Virginia this year, and it held them more in check. Not last night. Jaheim White, that big run on the jet sweep. New play, Tony. Not a new play in terms of jet sweep. I don't know that we've seen Jaheim White run that this year. That was, that was nice. Get him the ball. Get him at full speed on an edge where he can turn. Goes for 55 yards. That's the first rush play of over 50 yards for West Virginia this year. Very good. Traylon Ray on the big 54-yard pass play. Just the second 50-yard pass play or more this year for West Virginia. Those both came in the same day. So that was massive. We talked about the number one, the receptions Jalen Anderson has on the year after catching the big one. Mm -hmm. His first one of the year, guys. How about that? Also, back to play calling. Five receptions by running backs in this game. Didn't have time to go back and check that. That's got to be a season high, though, for those guys. So they utilize the backs in the passing game as well. So I thought it was a good job mixing up the play calling. Yeah, nine different receivers caught 18 passes. Correct. Really good. Guys have mm -hmm. to make plays. Right. Right? Use nine different receivers there. Let's talk defense here for a second. We saw the, the big pass plays be a problem again, and that's something that – 
It's, so we're eight games in, and it's every game, guys. It's every game there's a big pass player, too. That's the frightening part moving forward. You found some success offensively. You continue to be pretty good against the run. But, man, that coverage just continues to be a major problem, which is frightening as you head down the stretch with these last few games. It's a shame for the defense, guys, because through most of three quarters, they had only given up seven points. Arizona right. scored that other touchdown late in the third quarter. Up until that point, you looked up and you said, I mean, I don't feel totally comfortable here, but you're producing, right? You're producing. You forced a couple throwaways for Noah Fafita. He leads the league in throwaway passes by a good margin. You forced a couple of those, but you probably didn't get the consistent pressure on him that you wanted. That left that back end vulnerable at times. West Virginia, I, I said this on Thursday to you, Tony. <clears throat> to back up the point that you thought Nico and the offense was going to have to go win you the game, not just hold on. West Virginia had only held three opponents out of its last 15 under 21 points. So now, now that goes three of 16. That's FBS opponents, by the way. Mm -hmm. So you still need work on defense. You still need some guys to make plays on that side, Hoppy. Which one of those guys, though, let's say welcome back to TJ Jackson. Mm -hmm. That's a tremendous free agent acquisition, guys. It really is. They did a nice job getting him on the waiver wire, Hoppy. <laughs> so that was excellent. We've talked stops before. That's that PFF stat that's a, it's defined as a play that constitutes a failure for the defense. Jackson yesterday had seven of those. Next closest defender had three. That seven is the second most in a game this season. So does it make a difference when TJ Jackson's in the game? It does. Yeah. He's been, he, he's been and really he's been good. Play, and he's been playing hurt, too. He's yeah. not 100%. He just kind of goes out there and guts it out there. Yeah. couple last things, and then you can ask some questions on grades if you want. Team-wise, that's the best passing grade of the season. As a team, that's not just a quarterback grade. That's the whole team in the passing game. Second best passing game grade. Third best pass blocking grade. Again, significant when you remove a potential NFL first rounder and a guy that hasn't given up a pressure and you still pop off your third best pass grade. So credit Johnny Williams, right? We talk a lot about Nico and rightfully so. Credit Johnny Williams for coming in there and having a, a nice performance as well in, in his first start of his career. Second best receiving grade. What helps your pass game? Uh, receivers that make plays. Receivers that make plays and get open. They did yesterday, right? So congratulations to the receivers. Second best run grade as well. So you bust off your best pass grade, your second best receiving grade, your second best run grade. You're going to win some games, Hop, yeah. when you do that. Mm -hmm. I mentioned already, but it, it's worth noting again, biggest play of the game from an increased win percentage perspective, that fake punt by Leighton Bechtel added Field almost 14% to your win percentage probability. Yeah, those are all good numbers. Well, Hudson, Hudson Clement. That's uh, that's Mike's kid, Mike Clement. Yeah, it is. Plays Mike's over, boy. Plays it over is. at the food court. Sure. Um, again, dude, he just has a little something in him, man. He just makes plays. Uh, there were two two wildcat defenders on the back of that end zone. Uh -oh. He goes up there and just says, "No, I'll take this." Just a, he just a, he ballers. He's a baller. That was that was a great play. You're right, Tony. And it was, it was patience on the part of Nico to get Huddy let Huddy get a chance to get to the back of the end zone. And then throws a fastball in there, and all you see is Huddy's arms go up. You know, he had to go up for it. There were defenders around him. That was that was a remarkable tough, play. By tough him. contested catch. Credit to Hudson. And then good patience by Nico. Yes. On fourth down, when it's closing in around you and you've got to make a play to hang and wait for yes. him to drag across. Yes. That's, again, the patience of Nico at times for a, a – inexperienced quarterback in terms of game snaps that was really impressive well, let's do one other offensive shout out real quick it was your third highest graded offensive player well, i'll give you two nico was your top graded offensive player your third highest graded player was Traylon davis he eviscerated somebody on one of those plays on the outside johnny williams blocks down was it a fourth down play i believe mm -hmm. blocks down on a fourth down here comes Traylon davis across <laughs> absolutely was a car crash for that kid <laughs> i mean his whip back i mean just drilled him so good job Traylon davis your second highest graded offensive player this is an important note and you didn't probably say his name a bunch but he had a massive catch justin robinson huge yes that was a big f what, huge. so two things what a great play call in that bunch setting, Dunlap about came out of his chair on what a great play call it was to try and avoid the man pressure and the grabbing off the line, and they bunched it. Robinson cuts in. Nico delivers it. Massive fourth down conversion for Robinson. Yeah, talk about the efficiency of the passing game. Here's the uh, here's what that means. So Justin Robinson was targeted three times. He caught three. Cole Taylor was targeted four times. He caught three. Jaheim White was targeted four times. He caught three. Traylon Ray 
three targets, two catches. Hudson Clement, two targets, two catches. I need some more targets. Rodney Gallagher, three targets, two catches. Jalen Anderson, Traylon Davis, and C.J. Donaldson all targeted once and each caught the ball once. So that that's why you threw 82% completions, right? You didn't have uh, you didn't have a lot of lost passes um, out there. So um, those are those are big big numbers. What big was numbers. Uh, what was McMillan's PFF as a passer? It was really good. I mean, well, he might have been the second best passer in the game. I mean, he had he, he should have had two completions. I mean, that one. How about oh, that one he dropped? Oh, oh, oh. Need the breaks. Mm. Ooh, Tedaroa McMillan. We said that a thousand times during yeah. the week leading up to this, and in the game, and he <laughs> let and and he lived and he lived up to his billing. Ten catches, two hundred and two yards, Jeez. a touchdown with a long of forty nine. He was targeted thirteen times. Yeah, well, that's what you should do. Should, uh, how many? Just, how many Fafita throw it? Because he should have been targeted more. Yeah, just throw it to him every time. Targeted thirteen, and he completed ten of them. He was Oof. he was three of three on balls of twenty yards or more. He was four of seven on balls between ten and twenty. He was just he was really good. You know when you've got a long receiver out there oh. like he is with fluidity. You know if they're going against your team, it's hard to watch. But like if you're just out there watching that dude, it's that's a player, man. There was a time Tony at one of his catches where there were literally three Mountaineers around him. You might remember it, and he went up. And caught it was like a jump ball late in the game on the near sideline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just, that Whoa. was and that pass was absolute oh, total he just, desperation. Yeah. He just total desperation. It, he wasn't looking. No, he wasn't. He, Fafita spun in a circle and threw it like that was one of those when you play uh, backyard football and the quarterback is also the punter and you have to declare <laughs> this is a punt. Right, you yeah. call it. Right, we're done running our offensive series. We're going to punt. I think Fafita called that out before he threw that. Yeah, I think he just called it out. Hop and said this is going to be a punt. But you know what? It's not a bad play if you throw it in the area of McMillan. No, it's not a bad right? play. Chances what are, what the heck? He, yeah, chances are he's going to get it. Chances are he's going to get it. Yeah, um, he's eligible for the draft, right? He's a, he's able to go because he yeah he's he definitely needs take to go. Could he yeah, please yeah, go? Be, Could he great please? College career, we'll see. Yeah, he watch he, on Sundays next year. Yeah, yeah, he needs to go. That was um, that was that was a pretty impressive you know, and, performance. And that stands out because of that that pass game or, of McMillan. But West Virginia did a good job on the run. Of stopping the run. Yeah, they are. Of slowing the run. They're I mean, a good run of... stop team. Yeah. They truly are a good run stop team. Um, I think Tedaro McMillan, the way that he dominated the game, similar from a West Virginia perspective to a Kevin White when Kevin had his unbelievable season. It's that kind of stuff. Like, hey, throw it near him. He's going to yeah. catch it. Like a Reggie Rimbert. Throw it in his area. Throw it near him. I'll, I'll, I'll come get it. Three guys before the game. We're going to get an interview. You got some individual grades on players? Yeah, if you want, I'll give you a couple there offensively. All right, let me just tell you this. The three guys before the game is brought to us by Lou Wendell Marine Sales here in the state of West Virginia, located in St. Albans. Well, we were flying the other day. I didn't notice. There's a pretty big piece of water near Tucson. Really? Yeah, some kind of a lake. Do this, do that. Don't know exactly what it is. I just saw a big piece of water. And uh, anyway, probably could get a Lou Wendell pontoon in there. They sell the Avalon manufactured pontoon boats, which are made right here in the United States in the state of Michigan. Silver Bell Lake. Silver Bell? Silver Bell. Yeah, you can put a pontoon in that. Uh, Lou Wendell Marine Sales, the premier pontoon boat dealer in the state. I think we can go ahead this point late in the season. The premier boat dealer in the state of West Virginia. Pontoons, G3s, whatever kind of boat you need. John boats, Bob boats, Tom boats. They got all the boats. At Lou Wendell Marine Sales, you can visit them at LouWendellMarineSales.com or visit them at their location in St. Albans. The experts when it comes to boating here in the state of West Virginia. Individual grades, anything popping at you? I think it's it, it really just kind of fell along what you would think. I gave you the top three offense with Nico, Justin Robinson, Traylon Davis, Jaheim, and CJ are right there. Traylon Ray in the top six as well. Hudson also top ten. So... That's as you would expect. You look over at the defense. Jo- Josiah Trotter walks away with a with a good grade. Fagan's up there. Jackson's up there. Crandall. So that's kind of interesting. Two year top four being corners. And again, I know there was some busted coverages there. There was there's enough blame to go around on all of that. But that's that's the concern, guys. You've just got to find a way to either get some more pressure or stop the busts. That was really the thing. You, 
they were I know they were completing passes underneath, but again from a results points basis, you're mostly through three quarters only giving up seven. So you're around it. You can give up yards, hop. Mm-hmm. Just try and step up in key moments. But it's those big plays that come so easily. That's that's what makes put so much stress on that offense in hard to win games when you're having those those big plays against you every single week. Brad, there was that moment where it was late in the game and Arizona was starting to make a run and I think West Virginia scored or whatever and you said what you have to prevent now is Arizona scoring quickly mm-hmm. and what happened and they scored quickly in about two minutes yeah because you needed them to work some clock because they still needed the ball twice to get the win Johnny Williams real quick let's point out some I said the pass blocking was excellent Remac off the charts and pass blocking Johnny Williams your second best pass blocking grade behind Remac wow so really good a lot of unsettledness early in the game with motion up front on both offensive and defensive mm-hmm. lines. Something was going on there with cadence or, or something. It's a, because it's a different voice. Yeah, that's what you wonder. Was it was it just Nico's different? How he calls it was different. They were jumping off too. Yeah, they they had some oh, offsides, and you had some false starts. It was I don't a know. Lot. It was weird. Yeah, it was really weird. The way that game started, you thought, uh oh, we're in for an. 11 and 12 penalties on these two teams. Right? Yeah. And we're yeah. in for a big play getting called back on a flag because those guys were liking to throw those flags early. And, one, and fortunately, one was on a run by Fafita when they called a hold. Well, that was an excellent call. That was right on it. That was perfect. <laughs> Same crew, I believe. I need to check this. Same crew as we had at Oklahoma State. That's the Kevin Marr crew. That's the crew that worked the uh, Big 12 championship game last year. Yeah. I'd like to see. I'd like to sit in sometime. Excuse me? I'd like to sit in sometime when they do. I'm sure they do an annual review, instruction, go over things. Oh, yeah, they do it at media day. Really? I'd like to go sometime. You know, Alan, remember Sweet Alan Taylor? Yeah. He used yeah, to work yeah, here? Yeah. He used to go to that in the spring is when they have it. they bring all the officials together, and they would clinic. And uh, he would go to that. I would, I would like to see that and yeah. have them go through the holds, yeah. pass interference, and targeting. Just watch just to better understand. Not to criticize necessarily, but better understand. That targeting, man. Well, hold, and I mean, hold Holding too. and pass interference, too, because they allow, so hands, subjective. They allow hands on you in the defensive backfield, it's but sometimes one. it's called sometimes. I, I mean, not. there are sometimes you watch it and they call holding, you watch it, oh, yeah, okay. It is what, they called it on Remac one time, right? Had his arm around the waist or something. Okay, that's a hold. But other times where your hands are still in, well, I, I would have liked to watch that sometime. Couple, you, couple other numbers real quick. Can I go back to some other numbers? Because I, because I think your game, you, you took control of the game, in in the first quarter. Right. You ran twenty two plays to their five. Mm-hmm. Hoppy, twenty two plays to five right. first quarter for a team that's reeling like Arizona. That probably wasn't comfortable. You had time of possession in the first quarter, twelve minutes forty two seconds to their two minutes and eighteen seconds. That's where you see some control, yeah. right? Time of possession for the whole game. You're plus 10, right? Well, that, that's where it came. Yeah. 12-42 to 218. Your plus 10 came right there in the first quarter. Complimentary football. You hear that yeah. kicked around sometimes. So two displays of that during the game. One, the forced turnover. K.K. Tarnu, Garnet Hollis recovers. West Virginia goes down, drives it, gets the points. That is complimentary football. Zay Jennings with an explosive Special teams tackle on yes, a kickoff return, yes. hammers them back. Yeah. Subsequently, the defense pushes them back even mm-hmm. further. They have to punt. You get a short field. You score a touchdown off of that. That's but perfect that's the complimentary one where, though, football. The, the re- yeah. replay helped you. That's why that was going to be such a missed opportunity because you got the great special teams coverage. Your defense absolutely stood up and forced the punt, and then he shanked the punt. It was a thirty-six yard punt. So you had all those things working. That's why that was going to be a devastating offensive yeah. possession. Yeah. But it started with, as you said, Tony, it started with a guy making a play and then the sack, and then you forced him back and yeah. So but I tell you, uh, I had some of my boys at the game, because I have a couple friends that live out there, and they texted me when West Virginia's up twenty four to seven and said, Wow, we don't feel good about this. <laughs> <laughs> which is classic. And I don't think anybody did. You probably didn't either. Just like, uh... I felt good um, when it was, what, 18 points? Was it 18 points and uh, 13.55 to go in the fourth quarter? I think it yeah, was. Yes, 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 it was. 18. Yeah. Yes. And I thought, okay, just don't let them score fast. Boom. Boom, chuck a luck. And then points. all of a sudden, your pucker factor goes yeah. like, you start doing the math going like, whoa. And then it comes down to... 
Jalen Anderson, as soon as he goes out of bounds, then you can do the math. They're out of timeouts. So you yeah. go, thank the Lord. So here we go. We were doing, yeah, so you're right. That was the point when I said, just, just make them take four minutes to score here, and you're okay. They're not going to have right, enough right. time scoring two. And then we were doing the math along with that. And they, and they listen, Arizona managed that clock well, taking yes. their timeouts the way they did. You had to get, you had to have that play. Otherwise, you were going to give it back to them with time. So that's a great four and a half minute drive right there to kill that time. Right to it kill was. the final four and a half minutes. That's a long time, and certainly as 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 big a playability as that Arizona team had, you had to close that out. So again, with a quarterback without a lot of game experience to manage through that, Anderson to come off the bench with a pinch hit home run, basically a, a massive, massive way to close that out and get a a really good road win. All right, you guys ready to do this? Yep, ready to do this. Ready to do this. Ready to do this. Let's do this. <laughs> Textual healing on three guys before the game. That's the number that you can call 24-7. Actually, you can text it. Don't call it. No one will answer. No operators are standing by. 304-404-4083. 304-404-4083. It's textual healing brought to us by episode800.com. If you go to that website, you'll be able to uh, take a look at all of our uh, gear and things that we have available. We're all decked out today in various three guys gear. Brad and I are wearing Adidas. Hoppy is wearing, is that Peter Millar he's got on there? Is that Millar? Yes. Uh, Peter Millar. Plus, we've got T-shirts and all different kinds of stuff, and we're getting ready to uh, have our Christmas collection coming out. We doing popcorn again? Yes. Thanks for asking. We are going to do popcorn again. We'll have uh, information on that. It's like coming up November, so we're doing two weeks or so. November 10th, November 11th uh, is when we're going to be doing that. So uh, that's a good thing. And uh, that's, it'll take care of a lot of Christmas shopping uh, if you're interested. It's an easy way to shop. All right, let's do textual healing. Before, yeah, let me do this. So before we get into these questions, uh, let, me, uh, let me do it. I need to do a reset. Okay. Can I do a reset? Of course. Because I think that um, over the last couple of weeks that – Obviously, things had not gone well up until uh, last night. You lose a couple games, so a lot of people get uh, very, very uh, upset. Totally get it. Totally understand it. And uh, we feel it as well. Totally get it. Uh, but there seems to be a, I'm not going to say lack of understanding, but a misperception as to what, um, and I'm, I'm not going to speak for these guys. I'm going to speak for me. I think some folks don't understand my relationship with the WVU athletic department and with this show. And the reality of it is that I work for both sides, so to speak, if there are sides, have for a long time. And so I had kind of like this epiphany after the Iowa State game when we got a lot of questions or a lot of text that said, you know, fire Neil Brown, fire Jordan Leslie, fire this, fire that. Don't you understand the record against top 25 teams is, is whatever it is, is like non-existent and things like that. And I, and I, we rent, used a bunch of them. I used a bunch of them that day. Cause it was just like, okay, just here they are. And then I had this epiphany to myself going like, you know what? That's not a good place for me to be because it's just not fair to the people that I work with when I go to WVU, like the last thing I'm going to do is sit here and sing a story and say, hey, fire Neil Brown, fire Jordan Leslie, fire everyone else. Uh, everything is terrible. And then go over and literally work with these people. That's not a position that I want to be in. And that's not a position that I'm going to be in. And so it gets repetitive. Like we completely understand. And my intent is to talk about these things in general terms. And these guys can do whatever they want. They can say whatever they want. And I think the history of the show shows they can say whatever they want. We've gone through a bunch of stuff, football and basketball since the show started, but that's not me. I've never been a coach killer. My assessment is always this, let the thing play out, then do your evaluation and see where you are plain and simple. 
But if you think I want to get on here and say, hey, fire this guy, fire that guy, fire Dana Holgerson, never, you know, fire this guy, everyone's terrible, not going to happen. If you want that kind of a podcast, then you got to find another one when it comes to my side of things. That's not this. Never has been, never will be. I think a lot of the folks that are upset is because I'm not agreeing with you. And as a result of that, you're not going to hear what you want to hear. So if that bums you out, then sorry, but that's been the premise of this podcast. And I'm not changing that. Find another one. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having us. But that's kind of my position. I just don't think it's fair to do that in my situation. Tony, I would agree with that. I think you're right. I mean, you're you're not in that. You accurately define your position, and it is it is unfair to expect you to be somebody who's going to say fire this guy or fire that guy. I think I think that is a candid and accurate uh, representation on your part. Uh, you know, I have a little more latitude. I'm not. I don't take any joy either in saying you should, you know, fire this coach or that coach. I, but I have a little more latitude because I'm not employed by the university. But I see my role more as a reporter. Here is what's going on. I can relate to you what is going on, maybe offer in some opinions, but try to gather insight and say this is where things are. So I have a little more latitude than you do. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So just kind of clear the air. Maybe some people joined us in midstream, don't quite get the association or the relationship, but that's kind of – where it is and uh going forward that's that's it all right yeah let's do these uh texter i may have screwed these sheets up by the way oh i don't know i just don't know if it, what's your what's your first what's the first word on your sheet still many okay yes yeah, so let's do this and i guess is right still many many questions but lots in front of them going into the bye week strange things have happened in this league this year and they will continue to to occur signed by joe in Charleston, and Joe is holding a pepperoni roll, so I think I screwed this stuff up. But oh. anyway, fine. Brad, what have we said about this league, and what did we see yesterday? Small margin for error, balanced league. Anything can happen each week. Got to go out and produce. Yeah. That's that's what it is. I didn't see the end of TCU. That was a heck of a game. Yeah, it huh? was. How about the Houston's? Houston's. You said that. You said. You said during the course of the season, you go, "Here's what's going to happen. Like some games, they'll get blowed out." And other games are going to surprise somebody. A little bit of a surprise. I would have preferred for a league perspective they stayed where they were. <laughs> somebody needs to be easy, right? Is that what you're saying? Now Baylor's getting better. Yeah. I th- I, listen, I'm not plowing new ground here. I think Willie Fritz does a heck of a job. He's a, He's good, a good coach. coach. And there's a lot of talent in that area that I think they're going to finally figure out how to get. That's going to be a dangerous team as well. P1 Jason in Phoenix writes, so he was there. Hey, guys, oh. I'm, I am not a jinx. Remember, he was always saying that every time he goes, they lose. Just got home from the trip. Shout out to all the Mountaineer fans who were in Section 21 down by the field and stuck around to send country roads and congratulate the players. Tucson's the least intimidating environment I've ever seen. You couldn't even tell the game was scheduled. I went to the Arizona State-Utah game, and I thought that Tempe was, Tempe, <laughs> Tempe was pretty <laughs> soft, but now Tempe seems like the Thunderdome compared to Tucson. couple of questions. Do field goal kickers use juiced balls in the pregame to build confidence? Arizona's kicker made one from 65 in pregame that could have been a 70-yarder. He's a good kicker, He's got though. a leg. Yeah. He's a, oh, dude. Yeah. Does Hudson Clement have the best hands we've seen since David Sills? And did Sills have the best hands we have seen since Kevin White? You might. There you go. Please send my thoughts and prayers to John Antonick regarding a swift and speedy recovery of his glasses. I don't want him to have to drop a $10 pair at the at Walgreens on another pair, and neither does his relative, Stephanie, who works at my company. Always a West Virginia connection. I love the show. What um, happened? What happened was Tim Brando came into our booth pregame. Mm-hmm. Antona got up to make room, left his uh, readers on the countertop. Mm-hmm. When he came back, they were gone. So Brando wore them during the broadcast? Seems as though Antonic is making that uh, inference. Huh. I don't think Tim would take them, but maybe mis- mishandled them, put them into a breast pocket or something like that, and all of a sudden they were gone. So John's been talking about it now for about three weeks. <laughs> ben from Ohio, like I said last week, you need 200-ish passing and 50-ish rushing from Nico. That would make me feel optimistic about the future. You got it. Basketball question. I believe I saw Ken Palm had us going 13-16. and 16. So let's say the over-under is at 13 and a half. Brad, 
Do you think there's value in an alternate line that says 16 and a half? Ooh. A little high? Don't know. Why'd you grimace like well, that? Just I haven't, go, I haven't just gone and win through win yet. You, get, you talk about something that's difficult. Preseason win totals in college basketball with so many roster <laughs> transformations. Best yeah, of luck. Knows, yeah. You got to wait. It's like anymore with the transfer, you got to wait till like what? You, you Mid January. You got to just see some to... stuff. Yeah, that's a that's a tough market to play in. Hey, talking about Nico is that looking ahead, which we can afford to do. That was a pretty good audition for next year, wasn't it? Absolutely, absolutely, it was. No question. Yeah, that was uh, that was it. All right, that was it. By the way, uh, over under on cutaways to his dad in that game. Did they? I sat in. I, they had, our monitor was above my head. So That's a good time, place to put the monitor. The right only there, time I looked at it was like when there was a, re, a review going on. Cutaways, probably what, Brad? Five and a half? Probably. Um, funny situation. They have a patio behind their press room there. Yeah. And they had a chef back there. Really? We went. At, we were there early, early. This dude was cooking like unbelievable food. Some great looking chicken. He made. He would had grilled figs, balsamic vinegar on, like all these these roasted veg, the grilled vegetables. It was like really, really good. I go, man, they really feed these dude. Then I walked out where the tables were, and it said, Fox TV crew only. <laughs> Then after they ate, yeah. they cleaned that table up. You know what it was? What? Tater tots and corn dogs. <laughs> I got rid of that balsamic glaze real quick. You didn't, so you didn't get that. Nah, I, I got, yeah, whatever was there. It was fine. Okay. Texter, I just read Ren Baker's letter to Mountaineer Nation. It is not surprising that revenue and limited budgets are an issue for WVU athletics. A question I've had is what does the MAC provide to the university as means of support? And what do they provide to supporters? It would seem this is a time to consolidate the revenue streams that WVU Athletics does have coming in, including donation. Would it not make more sense to steer the donations into the trust? Mind you, I understand the trust doesn't support the university or contribute to budgets, but this would streamline donations into a singular pot and would assist WVU in being more competitive on the NIL landscape. Nick from Kingwood. So... Let's let's talk about Ren's letter, yeah. Because I think that here here was my biggest takeaway from that letter. Well, some might say it was football related, like whatever you want to call it, um, a vote of confidence, not a vote of confidence, whatever you want to say that it is, a kind of a perspective type thing. I personally think the biggest thing in that letter was the mention of where WVU is financially in comparison to other schools in Power Four and within the Big 12 Conference. Exactly. That was the biggest piece without any question of that letter. Because, and I know this isn't sexy type of stuff, but like what's happening right now within WVU and within all of the power four universities in the country when it comes to athletics is a complete redefinition of how they are going to work their money because this revenue share that goes into effect in July is asking athletic departments to pay up to 22% of their budget. Well, guess what? You can't really quickly amass which in West Virginia's case could be 20 to $22 million to pay to the student athletes starting in July. Like where does that come from? And that's a challenge that all of the schools are facing. So what's going on is departments like WVU have got to look at it and go like, okay, how are we going to do this? And the short answer is, that to think that you're going to go out there and generate, like I think the Mac might do, is it? Does 13 million sound right? Sound like you know? I don't know. And I think is that kind of like would that be realistic? They generate 13 million. Okay. Okay. Let's just say it's 13 million in a year. Now give me 33 million because I need another 20. Not happening. Can't do it. Just it's not there. Not going to happen. So what has to happen for WVU, quote unquote? to be able to be viable to make its revenue share payments, but at the same time keep the athletic department going. 
you need to have a redefinition of how you fund your program. And West Virginia proudly for years and years and years and said, we're self-sustaining as an athletic department. We're going to pay our own bills. Well, guess what? Those days are over. Schools, universities now need to realize and they need to figure out what their ability is going to be to help support athletic departments. That's the next thing. And so this is more than an athletic department thing. This becomes a university thing now across the country as to putting a value as a university as to what your athletic department does for your school, and you got to help them. Yeah, Tony, I, I agree completely with, with your analysis and, you know, in rereading the letter, he's trying to lay out candidly where things are and, and how WV is going to try, to try to get to where they need to be. What, what is not in here, which I'd imagine that he would do in one-on-one -on -one conversations with donors, is where West Virginia stands on like coaches' salaries, NIL money, uh, overall budget compared to other teams in the Big 12. And you're not in the top tier. You're not in the top three or four. You just aren't. No, you're below. It, you're below the bottom. You're, you're below no, the middle. You're below, you're below the, the middle. You're below the middle in your NIL. You are below the middle in your head coach salary. You are. Uh, the NIL is is to me the biggest thing. So. In order to be, in order to realistically, and this is big topic stuff, in order to, I think, realistically say we want to be in the top six or seven, well, you've got to do the math and you've got to say in order to get there, you have got to fund the thing at least in the upper half, at least from eight up in order to want to finish in the top eight. Otherwise, the schools that have more money are just going to go get the players that you want and they're going to have the players. It's, it's quite simple. So... You've got a new president coming in at WVU. That's going to be massive in importance because that person has got to have the philosophy of supporting the athletic department. It's key mm -hmm. to the future mm -hmm. of West Virginia because if you don't, you're not going to have the dollars to go get the athletes that you need. And right now, that's where this thing is. So that was my biggest takeaway no, from that. Right. Finally coming out and going like, hey, guess what? We need to figure this thing out. And, and look at this line. We are deep in our planning with our goal of with our goal of maintaining our current 18 varsity sports. What we've not yet finalized is the ongoing level of support we will be able to offer each program. I mean, yeah, it, because that's that's part of it, guys. It's not just the, the raising of new dollars. There's going to be cuts. That's the other way you gain money. You go mm -hmm. raise more or you cut. There's going to be cuts. If you've been following the national landscape of that, there's been articles out there reporting on that. There's going to be opportunities that go away for some of these other sports. That's just the reality of the situation where it is. Mm -hmm. I do think once it becomes the revenue share, that will help normalize some of this. For example, there's schools in the, in the Big 12 right now. I'll use BYU as an example because the report was out this week that they have their, their NIL spending. Then when they need different players, there's more money that's available on an individual basis. They reportedly just offered the number one high school basketball player in America $4.5 million for a one-year deal to come play there. <sighs> Above, that's one guy above and beyond what they are already paying wow. in an NIL deal. So they've got some pockets that are basically unlimited right now. Once it becomes revenue share, that normalizes that a little bit. Now, do collectives still exist outside that? A lot of people think they will, but that's supposed to be more traditional NIL commercials and such, autograph sessions, that sort of thing. The bringing it back in-house, you've got the immediate hurdle and problem of finding that $20 million dollars for those individual schools, but that should keep that quote salary cap a little more in range than what it appears right now. Mm -hmm. um, Rick Barnes, the head basketball coach at Tennessee, the longtime coach at Texas, uh, came out and he explained how they do it. And he said, basically, this is an NBA model that we use of salary structure. And quite simply, we go and target three or four players and he said, they make a good amount of money. So we're going to pay three or four studs, and then we're going to try to fill in with other players on dollar amounts that are significantly less. That's how we're doing it, and that's where this thing is going. It's, Brad, that number is really stunning. I just did a quick search. That is equal to 
what the 13th or 14th first round player in the NBA will make next year in his Correct, first year. So quite frankly, it's a bargain. Really? It's a bargain because if the kid's the number one high school player in America, you're projecting him to be higher than the 13th pick in the NBA draft. And given what you pay coaches, if that guy turns out to be worth it, it's probably a bargain at four and a half oh. million. I mean, that's that's where you are. Again, that's that's what you're doing. But if you want to have the ability to play in that world and get that talent, you're going to need. You know, we talk about players have to step all the time and make mm-hmm. plays. This is a situation. It's always been this way in college sports. You've always asked individuals and fans to step up to support you. And I've said this many times. I started in the department in 96. The department had a roughly $17 million overall budget. 30 years later, that thing's grown to $100 million. So along the way, a lot of that's TV money, but along the way, donors and West Virginia fans have continued to step up. This is another change in philosophy where you're going to ask people to step up in a bigger way than they ever have. If you want to play on the biggest stage, you're going to need that, that help and that financial backing to give you the resources to play in that world. Yeah. I truly think universities have to make decisions. I really do. They have to make a decision if they're going to support their athletics program. They have to look at it from the perspective of what do we get out of this? What does West Virginia University get out of having successful football and basketball programs? What do we get out of it? Does it increase our enrollment? Yes, it does. So what concessions can they make? Back in 1996, when Neil Buckley was president, he, he took away – tuition waivers from the athletic department and West Virginia now pays about 12 to 13 million dollars a year to the school Mm -hmm. for tuition of student athletes well are those the kind of things that a university can look at now and waive or significantly decrease that because now that is less of an expense to the athletic department. Those are decisions that need to be made. Universities want to be recognized. They want to have the successful things. Now everyone has to help. It also is going to raise the influence of major donors even more because the more money you put in, the more ROI you're looking for. Yeah, no question about it. Anyway. Brad, you disagree? We'll save that discussion for another day. You don't think it's all donors? Continue on. John from Oklahoma City, he writes, you are looking live at the final score on the board as we are leaving. Couldn't believe how quickly the few fans showed up, then gave up in the third quarter. There you go. There's a scoreboard. Final thing, as we were leaving, there was a thanks for having us to a full elevator of Arizona fans who wished us a safe trip home. Perfect. That's a perfect execution. Very hospitable. Well done. I thought that crowd would thin out because of the family weekend. A lot of the, a lot of the moms and dads that were there, they didn't really care about the game. No. So they wanted to bolt anyway. So they said, halftime, we're out. Uh, really? Left at halftime? Yeah. Some did. I mean, yeah. we did notice. I mean, by, by, when, when the game got really interesting late, there was, uh, boy, the place was, looked vacant. I know it's a big old stadium, but. Yeah. Adam in Morgantown, an hour and a half before kickoff, met a very small resort in Montego Bay, Jamaica. Two people at the pool wearing college gear. Myself wearing a classy WVU tropical shirt. Of course. And the lady wearing a really weird all-white pit hat. I would be rather writing in to tell you about running into my Capitol High School science teacher, but instead I'm stuck at the pool with a pit fan. Sorry about that. First quarter text here. I listened to Brad on spreads on stats saying, keep an eye out for a first down interception. I think we'll take a first down fumble recovery. Let's go, Mountaineers. Thank you. In-game text, thanks for someone, thanks someone that we finally got one of the better Big 12 crews. Good Lord, the quality spread on crews is wide. Let's go, Navy J. Texter, my headstone, my headstone will stay. <laughs> you only had two hours sleep, Tony, yeah. so my you're excused. He- my headstone will say, <laughs> the Mountaineers killed him. <laughs> Checked my pulse on the last third down of the game. It was 169, signed by Jake from Wirtz. He's cranking along there. Yeah. It was pretty tense. Texter, hi, guys. I know it's said if you have two starting quarterbacks, you don't have one, but I think we have an exception. Green, elite at certain aspects, but there are important areas where he struggles at this point. He is who he is. Mark Yule is an ascending player who isn't yet elite anywhere, though there are flashes, but he isn't necessarily a liability anyway either. I think both need to play situationally. Signed by Sean. See you in Lubbock. Texter. Great win. Defense was bringing lumber. 
some really big hits. Again, halfway through the third quarter, looked like play calling was not to lose, need to keep the cleats to the turf. Anyway, very proud of our staff and players. I thought yesterday stood out for some of the more physical hits of the season. Mm -hmm. Anthony Wilson was absolutely uncorking old school Mountaineer football there, right? Right. Sending people back in their tracks. Um, He led the Mountaineers in tackles. Texter, Professor Vinny, so I'm trying to be a happy Harry instead of a Debbie Downer. A win's a win, and winning's hard. West Virginia can't control the record of the teams they play, but eventually they're going to have to beat a team with a winning record. Win's a win. Wins a win, not doing that, because Indiana, no one's looking at their schedule. Iowa State, nobody's looking at their schedule. They don't get demerit points for playing bad schedules. Not going to do that. Win, win the games. Not going to have that discussion every week after wins. Just not. Because here's the thing. The, we could go through the losses and the records of the teams you lost to, but nobody care, Nobody seems to care about that, right? So you just, I'm not going to do that with the teams you beat. Win the game, on the road, tough win. He just said it, tough to get wins. So you're probably not going to like the next text. I just can't get comfortable with this Neil Brown team. It seems that we always find a way to make bad teams look good. Arizona lost this game more than we won it. Our secondary is easily exploitable, and I haven't seen improvement for them all year. You know, I, I don't I don't agree with that. I, I just think that there again, we've talked over and over about the parody in this league, and when there is parody, it often comes down to the team that makes fewer mistakes and you force other teams to make mistakes. So Brad, a number of times this season, several times we say, okay, West Virginia uh, it was pretty even on paper, but they made more mistakes. And this was a game where West Virginia played pretty clean. The other team made mistakes. That's what you get in the totality of a season where there's a lot of parody. Yep. <laughs> You're not working with me here? I mean, that's it. Go ahead. Keep going. Had a situation. What? On the plane. What happened? Going out. What? Get a tap in the air. Tap on my left shoulder. Guy behind me taps me, and here comes a really super long Slim Jim <laughs> being passed to me. He gives me, he gives me, you know what he gave me? He gave him the Slim Jim whip. Oh. <laughs> He says, "Fly rod." He says, "You want this fly rod, Slim Jim?" You know who it was? Who? Phil, president of GoMart. <laughs> he was on the trip. Was, was it there. really? <laughs> he was on the trip. Very good. Yeah, Phil was there. Very well played. Good. Just, just, just trying to be. In a, I mean, he knows. I mean, he yeah. gets it. Uh, he. Uh, I don't know. What, I don't know if he. That was like a clan. If he, if he snuck that oh, on I'm there sure in his bag did. or whatever. But I mean, it was. I mean, he. He was like giving that thing the fly rod whip. So what do you think? You're just sitting there calm while you're thinking about your probably game prep, and here comes a Slim Jim. Yeah. Well, he had a lot of he had a lot of nice things to say about uh, Connection 304. That's you know, a they good sell that, They sell that there, and distribution yeah. continues they sell to that at yeah. the GoMart. Yeah, they do. And uh, just a reminder: when you go to GoMart, get that rewards card because you instantly save on food and fuel, and those triple reward points. Let me just look at the calendar. Are we going to run out of days? So 31st. Uh, just get your rewards card. And save a ton. Yeah, but Phil and I were talking and uh, talking a little bit about Big Candy. You know, that's gonna that's taken over there. Sure. So Well known. I asked him, I said, is business seasonal at the Go-Mart? Hmm. He said, um, not like it used to be. Not really? seasonal. Yeah, it's like all the time now. Pretty consistent. Pretty consistent. They're just selling stuff. Yeah, including the Fly Ride Slim, Slim Jim, the uh, 52-pound bags of M&M's. Um, I don't know what location, but now I understand they got a forklift. Excuse me? Yeah, because the, the, the M&Ms are so big, if you buy one of the big bags, <laughs> they'll just get a forklift driver. He just kind of takes it from the front door and puts it in the back of your uh, back of your vehicle. In the, in the Mountaineer weight room, when they're doing squats. Yeah. Big thing, big thing of peanut M&Ms. So he said the source. Connection 304 is selling well in the yes. stores. Yeah. He hasn't tasted it yet. What? Our buddy Ford. You know Ford works over sure. there? Ford works over there at the uh, long time going around for a long time. So he, he, Phil said I was at tailgate last game and Ford had some and he said, and he's having, he goes, this is great, but he didn't offer Phil one. <laughs> so <laughs> Phil, said, I'm, Phil said, I'm still looking for one. And, but he said he was going to Parkersburg this weekend. So he was just going to stop in there at Parkersburg. Go to the mothership early. there and get well, one. Well, he has the stores. I mean, yeah, I know, he could stop I mean, by one of his own stores. Well, it'd be nice if one of his employees would offer him one. I mean, Ford slacking on that thing. Uh, Ford liked it. Wanted to keep it for himself. Yeah. I mean, apparently so. Thank you, Ford. Apparently so. Um, and those, uh, by the way, I also talked to Phil a little bit. You know, there's there's a couple a good good relationship there between the the Tudors folks and Gomart. 
Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah, they got a lot, there's a, lot, a little synergy there between mm-hmm. them. And uh, thanks again, Hoppy, for giving us a Tudor's Biscuit. Start your day the homemade way with a Tudor's Biscuit. And as I've said, I'm proclaiming this as biscuit season. When the leaves change, they just taste a little bit better, yeah. I think. I don't know. I eat one in July. <laughs> well, I'm not saying only, you don't, but I just think they're more, taking one down in July. <laughs> more hardy, more hardy this time of year. But went, uh, went through the drive-through there at the one in. Take a couple right out on the boat. Which location did you go to? Saberton. No, not Saberton. I always say it. Suncrest. Right out here, Suncrest. You Suncrest. went to Suncrest. But where's the other one? Well, that's way out of your way, though. I mean, that's a big trip. That's a really dedication for you to go all the way. I mean, where you live? Yeah. Out there in that gated community. You yeah. go all the way across town to come over there? Well, I told the security guard of my gator community that um, I was leaving. Well, I thought, you know, I don't, do, nice. I don't do it every week, but just yeah. every now and then. Start your day the homemade nice way with a Tudor's biscuit. Texter, Justin, is it me or did it feel like the only time Arizona actually had success was on some weird, almost broken play? Despite the score, it never really felt that close. I know they were protecting an 18-point lead in the fourth, but it felt like they should have let Nico throw it a bit more. Happy to get the bye with a W. <laughs> but let me tell you something. <laughs> the score didn't feel that close. I don't know which game you were watching because I, I've seen that. I've seen that nightmare play out. Yeah, it was. I'm thinking, no, 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 no. That thing got sketchy there. Hey, Brad, how did uh, how close did percent winning percentage get? You, you were there. Were the first like within the first fifteen plays, Arizona had a had a slight advantage, and then it just it flipped the rest of the game. You were so for, again from a game control standpoint, as I said earlier in the show, game control you had that the whole way. It mm-hmm. it never varied a whole lot from there. Hmm. Not new fans are never they're ne- <laughs> they're never relieved until the end of the well, game. Well, I know. I mean, I get it. <laughs> I mean, I no, I trust me. I get that. I feel that. I hear you. I got it, and because of the pit game too. I got a yes. te- I got a text during the game. I hope this isn't like the pit game. No, I get it. Yeah. I mean, I don't. Yeah. And, uh, and, and candidly, you don't know if <laughs> if Jalen Anderson had not caught that ball and Arizona had gotten it back. Put it this way: your post game win expectancy graded out at eighty percent. I mean, you're in control of the game. Were you surprised that the line went to five and a half? No, injuries. There was speculation on the the Wyatt and Garrett. You could see the line go from two and a half, and it kept creeping up all week. Hey, Brad, did you look at um, PFF for Arizona? Mm-hmm. How'd that left tackle do? W- Wooten. Because he was the guy that filled in for their really good tackle and struggled the previous week. They took I the left wondered. and moved him to right. Oh, did they? They moved the right over to left. Oh, so he was at right tackle. Yeah. Okay. He was at right tackle. Texter, checking in tonight from Williamsburg, Virginia, on behalf of the P1 listeners and the family of the late, great Johnny Olashuk. I had the honor of officiating my cousin Amy's wedding tonight, capped off with the ritual singing of Country Roads. Timing could not have been better as the Mountaineers held on for the victory giving us another reason to belt out John Denver's song. Here is my always a West Virginia connection for two of tonight's stars. My company's U.S. office is in York, Pennsylvania. I've spent a lot of time there in the last eight years. I currently live in Chandler, Arizona. Minutes from Hamilton High probably goes without saying. I'd love to see both Jaheim and Nico play well tonight. So that's where Nico finished his career at Hamilton High School. Grateful for a Mountaineer win, even more so thankful for this rare weekend with family. Special shout out to you guys. Ready for this picture? For the after-party attire, take a look at this photo. After-party attire. This is the part of the podcast where that picture comes up of the after-party There's a attire. picture of a uh, two, three people, two guys, one girl. The girl's wearing pajamas. The guy's wearing an efforting T-shirt. And uh, apparently... There's a picture of three guys. That, that's picture, three guys. that picture is unavailable at this moment. We haven't gone to Photomat to pick it up yet. <laughs> signed by Brian in Chandler by the way of Weirton. That's my fault, by the way, because I didn't put pick on the uh, text. Oh, okay. There uh, it is. There it is. There they are. Look at that. She got pajamas on. Awesome. He got effort in t-shirt like on it. there. Brian's out there. Very good. So they just got married. He, he did the ceremony. The guy in the middle did the ceremony. Nice. They sang Country Roads when it was done. P.S. My cousin's last name is Clark. So Clark bars were handed out as the wedding favors. Plenty left over, so I'll make sure my mom, Donna O, drops some of those at the scores table for scopes and spreads upcoming hoops game. Hmm. TBD if any make it back for Hoppy. Hmm. Yeah, probably not. 
Probably not. Probably not. Hoppy's just a bit. Ow. Hoppy's just a biscuit mule. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't dealing. I haven't had a Clark bar in a while. They're really good. Clark bars are excellent. Probably underrated. Kind of like ginger ale. Very underrated. You yeah, know ginger what I mean? ale's underrated. Ginger ale's underrated. A lot of people great. say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, very All right, uh, ginger ale or 7-Up? Oh, ginger ale. Yeah, I was, yeah, ginger ale. I was ale. a 7-Up. Ginger seven ale up? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, depends. All right, that'll do it for us. What's so, our schedule, Nigel? We working next week? Yeah, yeah what we're going to yeah, do. We just, we just do shows, huh? Show up Thursday. We got, show, we got shows. This okay. is what we're doing on Thursday since the uh, Mountaineers don't play. We're going to do a preview of West Virginia's basketball season and its opening game against the Colonials of Robert Morris. We'll do that show Thursday. Okay. And then what we'll do the following week is we'll play the basketball game on Tuesday or on Monday. Monday and we'll come back on Tuesday and we'll recap the first basketball game. You do know that's election day. Well, you might not be here, but we yeah, will. Well, it's we'll it's also some. basketball season. So Whoa. we go. Wow. Well, boy's been a little bit edgy over there today. Wow, well, just you know, like... Careful, man. Give you a biscuit. You think it'd be a little nicer to him. No one being rude. It's basketball season. And it's true. we got to move on, Hoppy. We gotta I go. mean, we're not coming in here analyzing the yeah. congressional race. You may we're be... We're not a- coming in here doing the, the council in Work County. We're just going to come in and do basketball. <laughs> <It's> basketball. <laughs> I mean, you go do what you do. We'll do what we do. It's basketball season. Women's, uh, women's basketball opens up. Their first regular season game is on election night. Tuesday. All mm-hmm. right. Anyway, that's where we're We're going to be Thursday. We just... Just you'll be here. Sign up, subscribe, and you'll get it. Special thanks to our producer Ethan Collins for coming in early and doing the deal. Three guys brought to us by Comax Business Systems, keeping West Virginia's business data safe, secure, and efficient for 25 years. By GoMart, go for a GoMart Rewards card. Download the app or visit them at GoMart.com. Lou Wendell Marine Sales in St. Albans. They sell family fun. Visit them. By Tudor's Biscuit World, start your day the homemade way with a Tudor's Biscuit. And by Conley CPA Group, providing value beyond numbers. That'll do it for us. Off week for the Mountaineer footballers. Getting close to the start of basketball. And we will be back checking in for Hop, Brad, and producer Ethan. See you.